Hello, welcome, one and all, all in one, to the Man of Vault podcast, where we crack open our mental vaults on our thoughts on the game of Magic the Gathering. This is episode number one! Woo! Yeah, we made it! We did it! I am your host, my name is JC, and today I am joined by Arvin. You are not wrong. You are not. Hi everyone, I'm Arvin, like you said. How's everyone doing? Man, so, Arvin, where can people find us? So, actually, if you want to, I'm assuming you're watching this on YouTube, so you're already here. Thank you for showing up. So you can just hit that like button, subscribe, leave us a comment, hit that bell icon, so you know when we post some new content. Also, if you go on Twitter, it's vault underscore mana. You can find us right on Twitter whenever we post new content. We'll probably post it up there before it goes live. And if you want to get our attention, be sure to use the hashtag GameBayTay. That's G-A-M-E-B-A-E-T-A-E. It's all one word. All right. So we're going to move right into our opening segment, which is called Planeswalker's Favor. We're going to pick one of our hosts each week to pick a card that's a pet card of theirs, a card they enjoy playing in Magic that maybe you don't see in every deck uh, in every competitive format. But, we're going to talk about that card and where it's good and why it's good. Today, I'm up. Yeah. And the card I want to talk about is a little card from Magic Origins called Liliana Heretical Healer. Ah. So for anyone who doesn't know, Liliana Heretical Healer is one and two black for a legendary creature, Human Cleric, I believe. Yes, she is a human cleric. And Liliana is a 2-3 with lifelink. And she says, whenever a non-token creature you control dies, exile Liliana Heretical Healer, then return to the her to the battlefield transformed under her owner's control. If you do, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. Mm -hmm. So there were five planeswalkers, flip planeswalkers in Magic Origins, and they all had a condition for exiling and coming back transformed. Liliana's is a non-token creature you control dies. The flip side of her is a three loyalty planeswalker with three abilities. Plus two, each player discards a card. Which is Liliana the Veil in Modern, which is a very good Correct. Card. Uh, the minus X is return target cre non legendary creature card with converted mana cost X or less from your graveyard, or it's converted mana cost X from your graveyard to the battlefield. And the minus nine. Oof. It's a good one. You get an emblem with, whenever a creature dies, return it to the battlefield under your control at the beginning of the next end step. Where I love this in Commander is black, mono black and black green sacrifice decks that care about your graveyard and reanimating. So Marin is a perfect yep. example. Yep. Uh, you have a ton of you have a ton of non-token creatures that you want to sacrifice regularly to get experience counters mm -hmm. so that Marin can bring them back to the battlefield. And getting a three mana Liliana out of that as well is pretty darn special. And because Liliana is a creature on her front face, you can reanimate her with Marin or with any of your creature reanimation spells. And then she helps you reanimate other things. See, actually what I kind of want to talk about is back to like Origins, mm -hmm. when Wizards did that whole like Planeswalker flip thing. I actually really, really enjoyed it. The whole transition, you have to meet a certain criteria to flip it. That was actually quite interesting. And all of them were pretty thematic. Jace was gaining knowledge yep. from his study with the Sphinx. Liliana it was the loss of her brother and him turning into a zombie to try and kill her that made her Planeswalker spark ignite. And eventually she brought a zombie with her. Exactly. The, she became the necromancer. Yeah. She, the flip side is called Liliana Defiant Necromancer or I something like so. that. Uh, so yeah, it's it's very on theme and it's just a very powerful magic card. All right, so that's our opening segment. Let's move into our main segment, which is we are introducing the core members of our YouTube channel and letting you get to know everyone, get to understand what kind of magic players we are and what brought us into the game, what keeps us going in the game, that sort of thing. Should be fun. All right, so our first guest that we brought on is Chris, the self-proclaimed alpha nerd. Hey! hey yeah. Golf clap. clap for the alpha nerd. All right. <laughs> so Chris, we have a few questions for you that we'd like to ask just to get to know you a little bit better and so our audience can as well. Okay. When did you start playing Magic? I started playing Magic, geez, probably about six six years ago. Okay. It was, it was right when M15 had just released. Okay. So about 
six years ago ish. That sounds about right. Yeah. So I kind of want to just follow up on that. Was that when you started playing competitively, or was that just? That was just playing in general. I I went to. I was in. I was actually not in a local game store. I went to a Target of all places. And, of course. And I, I walked in. I was like, "Hey, there's a there's a white fat pack box there. That looks cool. Bought it, and the rest is history. There it is. Okay, that's pretty yeah. good. I liked that story. <laughs> so I got one for you. What's so? What's your favorite format, and what kind of deck do you play in those formats? Oh gosh, my favorite format. It's always been between Commander, even though I don't play Commander anymore, and Standard. Standard I like in a sense where it's more it's more competitive, at least from my experience, and I like the limited card pool. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot more, well, janky brews that you can come up with, at least from what I've seen, and yeah, just in, in general. Mm -hmm. And Commander, however, I, I enjoy the freedom that it brings, and the social aspect that it, that it also as an addition to that. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So. What's your standard deck at the moment? Standard deck at the moment, this is this is right after the unbanning of Rampaging for us now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right after that. So I would say probably Jundasaurs right now. Mm -hmm. Now for the for the MCQ uh, weekend that I played in, I I played Ban Ramp. So that was probably the best deck that I've ever played in standard, at least recently. Now given I've always been a fan of dinosaurs though, so any chance I get, I'll play it. Of course, they're dinosaurs. They brought dinosaurs. Yeah. First we have dragons, now they're dinosaurs. Yep. Now, kind of leading off to that, what's your favorite card of magic and why do you really like that card? My favorite card of magic. Jeez. Yeah, it's quite I think there's just a couple. I would say Slippery Bogle. Mm -hmm. Slippery Bogle. Slippery Bogle. So why do you like Slippery Bogle so much? First of all, can you tell us what Slippery Bogle is? Yes. So Slippery Bogle, it's, it's a hybrid blue-green for, it's a 1-1 one -one with hexproof, that's the important part. And it's just, it's just an awesome card in general. It's, it's, is the main reason why green-white hexproof is even a thing, well, it's not really a thing right now in modern, but it used to be a thing. And I, I just love the card in general. It's also one of my favorite Dungeons and Dragons uh, monsters. There you go. Bogle. Interesting. I, I love Bogles. I think Hexproof is a very powerful keyword in Magic the Gathering, and I love creatures with Hexproof. And having one that comes out on turn one, and your opponent sits there looking at their Swords to Plowshares or their Path to Exile, their Fatal Push, and just goes, well, doesn't do anything. I guess I just get to watch that creature. Mm. That feels really good from from that side. Of the yeah, table. my my favorite part is it's like, hey, I'm playing my game. You can interact with me, especially when you main board for Layla and Sanctity. Yes, yeah. that's <laughs> so, pretty good. Normally with Slippery Bogle, it's played in vocals where you just make one small little creature. Hence the duck name. Yes. Yeah, very very large, and they can't target it, make it unblockable. You just keep putting stuff on it until it gets their opponent dead. Is that correct? Is that how? That that, that is pretty much. It's a build your own Evercool kind of style. Mm -hmm. So it's not bad. Like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of that deck. I really am. It's it's just I don't like playing against it. Oh, for <laughs> yeah. sure. Chris, what's your favorite color in Magic? Oh gosh, favorite color in Magic. See, I don't mind, but uh, that's so, myself. Uh, it's as much as I want to say blue. It's not blue. Okay. Really? It's I would say green. Believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's in most of the decks that I have played. They have to have some form of green in it. For example, Bant, Jund, um, just anything in standard that I play. And on top of that, Boggles. Yeah. The, you played Simic green. Manipulation before in standard, I remember. Exactly. So. I had a I had a Gliss of the Trader Stacks Commander deck. Uh -huh. back when I, I remember that one. Actually, I was a really big fan of your Simic Manipulation deck. Whenever you just whenever you were streaming online, you were doing that. You were just taking their stuff. Every time you played that deck, most of the time your opponent didn't really know what you were doing mm -hmm. until you just took everything and killed them. I don't know. I was a big fan of that deck. So yeah. uh, earlier in the earlier when we were talking, you mentioned you were the top eight of a uh, MCQ. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I was not the top eight, unfortunately. After day one and the Mythic Championship Qualifier Weekend on Magic Arena, just want to specify that uh, I was I was ranked number eighteen. Mm -hmm. We went, I believe. I went ten and ten and one, mm -hmm. and it was just a 
great experience overall. And then we went to day two. Eh, it wasn't the best uh, to say. Had the, some rough matchups. Yeah, to say the very least. Yeah. But it was it was still a very exciting experience, and I I am grateful that I had the chance to show my worth as an mm -hmm. engine player. Absolutely, yeah, of course. What deck did you play for the event? For the event, I played. Oh gosh, I played Bam Ramp. Bam Ramp. Okay. And out of curiosity, how do you actually qualify for this kind of like? The phantom of the yeah. So, so glad you asked. So, in any qualifying weekend, well, not weekend, any qualifying month, <laughs> you you will be if you're in the top 1,200 now. I believe they, they changed it, mm -hmm. uh, changed it to that. If you're in the top 1,200 of the month, you'll be invited to a Mythic Championship qualifier weekend where you will face off against well the the top the best of the best. Yep. And you just go from there. It's just like normal. Just competitive magic. You play ten rounds in day one, well, at most, and it's either two losses or a win. You make the next time. Absolutely, okay. perfect. Yeah. Well, Chris, really appreciate you stopping by, letting us. We ask do us have questions. one more question for you, though, and this is probably the most important question. Okay. okay. Do you prefer waffles or pancakes? I prefer pancakes. Okay. Why do you prefer pancakes? I prefer pancakes because. There's a lot more that you can do with pancakes and waffles. Now, sure, you know, people can argue the chicken and waffles. However, you can make freaking amazing pancakes. You can put any amount of butter you want in it. You right. can you can put you, you can you can. One of my favorite things is to make a like a sausage patty sandwich, with it. Mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. just go at it. See, but here's the thing. I think waffles you could eat at any time of the day. Pancakes, sure, you can like agree, you can like agree or disagree. You can eat them like at two in the morning. You wake up and you're like, man, I see some pancakes. Just take it, microwave them, whatever. But waffles just has that. So like that. So click. here's my counter argument to that. Okay. My counter argument is to make waffles. Like we're we're not including egg waffles here. Sure. We're, okay, we're, yeah, talking, sure, we're, sure. we're talking about real waffles you made yourself. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. So here's here's the reason why I like pancakes more because a it is way more accessible. Okay. Then, 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 then waffles because you have to have the waffle maker, and you know if, if you're in a rush, you might not have no. The equipment time. is definitely more yeah, specific. Exactly. So, That's true. So as as a college person, kid myself, I I prefer pancakes. All right, there you okay. go. Simply put, you heard it here first. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be right back with our next guest. So now we're back with our second guest, Ian, aka Dolan Babe. How are you doing today, Ian? I'm still breathing, so pretty good. Okay. That's, oh, good. That's a good start. That's, that's a, good start. a very good start. Okay, so we actually have a couple questions for you to so let the audience to, we're going to introduce you, let them have a little bit more of a background about you. Yeah. So, I have a question for you. When did you first start playing Magic? So, I first started playing Magic when my dad gave me a pack of Magic cards that said Starter Set 99 on them. That old? Do you still have them by any chance? I do have them at my house. That's, Ooh, that's, that's a very good thing. That yeah. is a very good thing. That's uh, amazing. Yeah, I started playing that, and then you know, took a break, came back on during Kamigawa, took a break, and you know, kind of jumped in and out. Okay. So do you play it more like competitively now, or do you just casually? Um, more competitively since about the Theros block, so like 2012, 2013. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good time to have a decent experience with it. So, <coughs> Ian, what would you say is your favorite magic format, and what makes it your favorite magic format? Um, probably standard, just because okay. you get fresh cards every, you know, every few months you get and a new set comes out. Yep. Sometimes the sets rotate, so, you know, you get, like, new cards that you can bring in, new cards you can use. And it's probably one of the only formats where I think some jank brews can actually beat some of the competitive decks, because in Modern, it's a lot harder to make the jank yeah, brews beat the Yeah, that's stables. true. And Commander, it's just going to be Commander. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> You're going to see all kinds of stuff in Commander, but definitely there are straightforward, staple yeah. decks that will always overtake the things that people are going to try to do. So, yeah, yeah. Of course, it's Commander's always going to be like different things that go on at the same time. What, so, what deck do you play in Standard? So right now, um, there, was a very, there was this cool deck I saw online where uh, this one guy I knew who uh, is famous for playing Tron Modern. I took an inspiration from him. And I was like, can I build a similar deck in Standard? Mm. And right now, with the current meta format, I could. Okay. And so basically, the it's like a green Tron, but it's not as 
consistent as the old green card. Sure, yeah, of course. The, sure, the Tron and Monk has much more powerful cards. Oh, much yeah. ways of they have actual like the Tron lanes that make seven mana. So you're relating it to Tron, which is a modern deck based on the lands Urza's Mine, Urza's Power Plant, Urza's Tower, which together produce seven colorless mana. We don't have those in standard. So how do you how do you create a green Tron deck in standard then? I'll give you two words. Mana dorks. Okay. Okay, that's pretty good. Basically, most of the time I can get turn three, I can get a six drop out. So not as good as Karn, but you know, uh, turn three Nissa or turn three Ugin is pretty good too. Yeah. Those so, those cards are extremely powerful in this standard good. format, so that is, that and is, then Karn is just like a toolbox card. Yeah. Basically, whatever deck I'm facing, whatever the situation is, I can kind of get a get a card to kind of fit the situation. My personal favorite is uh, God Feral Statue because against a uh, say Feather deck, making all their cantrips cost two extra. It's pretty mm -hmm. nice. And for clarification, we're talking about Karn the Great Creator, Correct. not Karn Scion of Urza. Correct. Since we do have two standard legal Karns. Yes. Okay. Only for a short time. So when you actually play this deck, um. When you make your mana, you don't actually make colorless mana. Do you have anything that requires colorless or anything that needs it? What are your like heavy hitters outside of like Karn or or not Karn, Nissa or Ugin? Is there is there a way you can just completely shut down your opponent after you let's just say you grab Godfather Statue? Or do you have any other combo pieces? Let's say. So, the the thing about the Tron deck is that when I looked back at it. There's not really a lot of combo pieces, it's more just, okay, I'm facing this, I need this card, or I'm facing this, I need this card. The main power of the Tron deck is that when you look at the heavy hitters, they're good, but when you look at, say, like a Liliana Dreadhorde General, mm -hmm. or say a, um, um, what was it, like a Carnage Tyrant that just, just powers through anything, mm -hmm. they're not as powerful, but the trick that makes Tron so powerful is that I get them out so much earlier. Uh, like a, a turn three Nissa, if they're not playing ramp, they're like turn three, even the control decks are like, they, they can't really deal with it. Okay. Not unless they're playing Absorb, and a lot of them don't really play that right now. Mm -hmm. So it's more like, you know, hey, I'm going to throw in turn three Nissa, turn three, you know, Ugin. You got that Dolan's Veto or you don't, and I'm basically just going to be like, turn let's sideways. go. Okay. Yep. So kind of leading off to the same question, you, you say you like to play green and standard, but what is your favorite color to match in general? Oh, I started off with the Starter 99 blue deck, so blue's always going to ah, be close to my heart. It's, it's blue. Everybody likes blue. They have counter spells. They have the most interaction. It's also one of the most powerful colors and magic. Which aspect of blue is your favorite? Like, what what makes blue stand out? To me, what makes blue stand out is the fact that you can stack so many things. Like, you can do a counter spell, you can do unsummon, like just bounce stuff back, you can draw cards. It's just, it's insane what blue can do. And then, especially if you compare blue with other colors, it just gets even crazier and crazier. Like, yeah. blue is just the, the color, is just so versatile. Like, mm -hmm. That's probably my favorite part, is that you can do almost anything Right. And even if you like get older and older in magic, blue just becomes very, very powerful. Yep. Look at like the power nine. Yeah, I was about to say someone once told me the power nine is artifacts and blue cards. Yeah, seems seems pretty good. It seems pretty good. Good reason to love blue. Yeah. Ian, what is your favorite magic card of all time and what makes it your favorite? So all time is gonna be a little interesting of one, but probably at the near the top of my list is going to be Prophet of Crucifix. Oh boy. Yep. Okay. That's a pretty Can you good tell one. us what is a Prophet of Crucifix? So Prophet of Crucifix is a wizard from the Theros block that is one blue, one green, three any. On all your creatures plus a flesh, untap all lands and creatures you control on your opponent's turns. Yep. So and it's insane because you can basically just flash in a bunch of stuff and then your opponents are like, okay, I'm on time. And I'm like, cool, I'm on tapping as well. I got blue counter spells ready to go. Yeah. So, or just flashing in more creatures. Exactly. You're kind of well known for playing a wizard's deck. Is that why like, you enjoy that card? Because it just slides in really well. You can just combo away. One time when I first started Magic, like, you know, back in um, when I started Magic again, like competitive scene, mm -hmm. someone once told me, yeah, you know, I'm playing modern, but you know, I just can't build a wizard's deck. And I was like, I'll take that challenge. Ah, and you did. You did. did. And that was when the Theros block was out, and I was like, this card is awesome. Let's build wizards. Okay. <laughs> okay, so. Fantastic. This is kind of this is slightly like, close to my heart. What do you like more, waffles or pancakes? So, I lived in the South for mm -hmm. three years. Mm -hmm. It has to be waffles. 
Okay, good, good choice. I'll give you that good choice. You got chicken and waffles. Mm -hmm. It's just delicious. Mm -hmm. Waffles are just, in general, in my opinion, superior to pancakes. Ah, I see, I see. Like, just so, the structure of the waffle itself, like, you got all those little divots in it. Mm -hmm. It can hold maple syrup, it can hold, like, blueberries, it can hold butter, it can hold nearly anything. Okay. And to be fair, it was in the original Shrek movie, Donkey doesn't say I'm making pancakes, he says I'm making, I'm waffles. making waffles. There was a Nickelodeon show called Cast Crash. The character's name wasn't named Pancakes, his name was Waffles. There you go. <laughs> it's just so many more people know waffles and like waffles because it's just waffles. But what would you say that pancakes are much easier to make and more accessible? Because uh, I don't know if you you are much you're well aware of Chris and he well he says he likes pancakes more than waffles. He says because they're much more accessible and they're easier to make. What would you say to that? So, I will say this. Uh, I do know Chris pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, we've been friends for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, I, when he, uh, when I met him again, I was like, oh cool, it's nice to see a friendly face when I yeah. come back to Michigan. Yeah. Um, I will say this. He is in completely entitled to his wrong opinion, <laughs> but, you know, pancakes are good if it's just like, oh, well, I don't care about myself, just roll it up, eat it. It's like, if you want to go that extra distance and you know, really enjoy your food. You <laughs> take the time and energy to make a waffle. I mean, that's just how it's done. <laughs> Weird swipe, but I like it. It's good. It's good. He's very entitled to his wrong opinion. I like that. I like I'm going to remember that one. <laughs> All right. One last question for you, Ian. Oh, this sounds like a doozy. Oh, it's the last one, of course. So, when I've played against you in Modern, I've known you to play a burn deck, but not a traditional burn deck. Correct. You play a red-black burn deck. Yes. Why black? What does black offer to Modern Burn that white doesn't? So, I think the biggest thing was, there's a card called, um, I believe it's Gonti's Machinations, mm -hmm. where basically it stays on the field because it's an enchantment, a one-drop black. Mm -hmm. And basically, if you take damage for the first time this turn, you get an energy counter. Okay. If you spend two energy, your opponent loses three life and you gain three life. Ah, so it's a one mana lightning helix if you build it up. Nice. Correct. Now, okay. the thing about it is it's a little awkward to play sometimes because if you got a fetch land and then no other fetch lands and you crack the first one, it's like, well, that kind of sucks. Yep. Yeah. But it's a little unique in the fact that it kind of just stays there and sometimes it can throw an opponent off because there's been times where I've played where. They're just like, just keep eyeing that machinations. They're like, okay, I gotta make sure I don't go too low, otherwise yep. I'm just gonna pop it. I see. So you're using more of like the surprise aspect of it, where if someone is playing burn, if they start off with the normal, like uh, Goblin Guy, Monastery, Swift Spear, like the normal stuff, they'll know it's on burn. If you start off with Gonti's machination, it's a little more of a surprise attack, where they, before they realize what's going on, their life total is too low for them to Well, react. that, and it, sometimes it's more of a psychological aspect, because sometimes the opponent, will make mistakes just because they're so focused on that. Mm -hmm. They won't notice me dropping like, you know, uh, Goblin Guy and two monster Swiss Bears and me like, turn sideways. Mm -hmm. They're like, okay, well, yeah, sure, whatever. And I'm like, cool. Got these machinations. And that will get them yep. the like, Exactly. Like, you also get some advantage from certain black sideboard cards as, as well, right? So, I believe, um, uh, what was that one from Eldritch Moon? Um, Collector Brutality? Yes. That's a pretty good one. It's a good card. magic card. Um, I play Surgicals anyway because it's for XC mana. Sure. Not busted at all, but... Yeah. But the ability to occasionally produce black and not have to do two to yourself. Yes. Definitely nice. definitely an upside sometimes. Mm -hmm. Especially in mirrors. Of course. Yeah. And then, um, what was it? Uh, what was the command? The uh, red black one from? Oh, Coligan's command. Coligan's command is a very powerful card. It's a very That's a good card. card in Magic right now. Yeah. It's, especially in Modern with Stoneforge Mystic coming back. Oh, yep. yeah. Yeah. No, we have Stoneforge. Good Magic card. card. going to be running around. Well, you know, Magic, they had to dredge up the past, you know, change things around. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ian, no, 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 they're not dredging up the past anymore because that deck is gone. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye, Hogak. We don't miss you. No, that card should never be allowed in Modern again. Well, uh, thank goodness. Ian, we thank you very much. Now we're just going to move on to our next guest. All right. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So, we are now joined by our good friend and fellow Mana Vault director, aficionado, Magic player extraordinaire. It's called the Hedgehog. Austin, host yeah. of Modern Meta Matchups on youtubecom slash the Austin, how are you doing today? Good. How are you doing, Jesse? I'm doing just fine. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Awesome. Austin, when did you start playing Magic the Gathering? Uh, so I actually started playing Magic um, right around the time that uh, Cons of Dark Gear came out. Okay. So it was a little bit after release, probably sometime in October. 
uh, I was playing with some friends of mine at college. They were they they both found out that they had played Magic in the past, around eighth edition, Kamigawa block. They played in that time, so they both brought in some of their Magic cards. They were playing. I watched, and then I eventually got involved in playing. I was just using some of their decks, and mm -hmm. then I was like, you know, I kind of wanted to try it out. So we found a shop nearby. I went there and uh, bought a couple uh, pre decks. Started out with the uh, the M15 white black deck. Mm -hmm. uh, centered on like life gain, I think, and maybe a little bit of discard. You know, your your general white and black type of cards. Yeah, sounds great. So. That was, that was when I started. Awesome. Been playing ever since. So, since you started around that time, I kind of want to know, like, what's your favorite format? What decks do you usually gravitate towards those formats? So, yeah, in the beginning, probably for the first two to three years, it was standard. Okay. Uh, a little bit of Commander mixed in as well. But as around the time that Modern Masters 2017 came out, I actually started gravitating towards Modern as my uh, go-to format. I, I was lucky enough at that point to pick up fetch lands. I had already started around con, so I had some fetch lands from standard. So that was just like a good time to get in for the mana base. Yep. Okay. I didn't That's have to spend a fortune trying to catch up and get all the fetch lands that you do now. Yeah, of course. So in those formats, if you did start playing modern or if it was standard around that time, that's when uh, like all, all the decks were, I don't want to say fun or a little bit more. I enjoyed that time. But what was like your favorite deck in those kind of formats that you played in? So in standard, I've had a few decks that I've liked over time. Uh, the first one, probably still my favorite standard deck that I ever had, which was like a, it was a a teamer deck, so green, blue, and red. It used a lot of the cards from like cons, like the Savage Knuckle Blade and mm -hmm. uh, the Surak that gave all your creatures flash. It yeah. couldn't be countered. Uh, and trample. Surak like Dragon Claw is a good <laughs> magic card. Yeah, and you had like the. Uh, Sylvan Carriage was in standard for a little bit. Yeah, even yeah, when that rotated, we had uh, Elvish Mystic and yep. Battleclaw Mystic. Yep. And I just like to be able to ramp those things out. Okay. Um, it was it was one of my favorite decks. Um, more recently, I don't play standard as much. Uh, generally, I just don't enjoy it as much as I used to. More just having to create a new deck. Pretty much every time a set comes out, mm -hmm. even though your cards aren't rotating, you're gonna sometimes decks survive. Uh, requires just a little bit of modification. Sometimes they completely die when a new set comes out and you have to go back, make right. a new deck. And uh, like uh, eventually other formats just become cheaper. If that's, if that's Right, and once you're in modern, if you, after a long enough time and you have a lot of the staples, you don't really need to change your deck that much. Right. And it becomes Definitely. easy enough to make new decks from the cards that you already have. Okay. Yep. So lately I've been playing modern a lot. Um, my two go-to decks right now are the, the Urza deck. Uh, That's very good deck. play like four colors, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Best part is it's a lot of basic lands. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Which is interesting for a four color deck, but it's it's a lot of fun. Prismatic Vista definitely helps with that for sure. Prismatic Vista and the, the Astrolabe. Yep. Um, you actually took that deck to an MCQ, right? Not I, too long ago? Yeah, that's correct. I uh, played it in an MCQ uh, a couple weeks ago with Urza. It was actually the last weekend that Hogak was still in the format. Yep. And how, so did you, how did you fare against Hogak? How did that like feel against Urza? And where did you like, make it in the MCQ with that? So, I have not played in a lot of competitive um, formats or like I haven't played in very many competitive matchups like that before. Mm -hmm. It was really only the third MCQ I had ever been to, mm -hmm. the second modern MCQ I had been to. Um, I hadn't actually played in any MCQs prior to a few months before this event. Yep. So I went in, I wasn't really expecting a whole lot. I wasn't 100% sure on how I was going to do because Urza was a relatively new deck to myself. Mm -hmm. It's not like Burn, which I considered playing because I've been playing Burn for years. Right. Uh, so I know how to play that deck against all of the, the decks in Modern. Whereas Urza, I'm still learning how to play it against yep. different types of uh, decks that I know I'm going to go up against. Mm -hmm. So I took it. I started out, I kept winning, um, end of round 6, I was 6-0, and oh. uh, it was only a 7 round event as far as the Swiss play, so I was able to just take a bye from there, so I ended up 6-0-1, oh, I was actually the only person to go undefeated in the Swiss play. That's pretty good. Uh, I went 2-0 and oh against Hogak, I played two other Urza matchups, I beat both of those, uh, I had a Grixis Death Shadow along the way, okay. as well as uh, 
uh, a Tron matchup, mm -hmm. not Green Tron, not Eldrazi Tron. So it was it went pretty well for me. Uh, once we got into the top eight play, I went up against another Urza deck. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't it didn't go in my favor. I was always a card off, or in one game I was even one single life point off. Oh, but man. I I I lost in the first round, but it was still cool. Yeah. I, I got to top eight in MCQ. Yeah, and which. That's go. not necessarily easy to do. So. No, of course, that's what really matters. The MCQ is usually like ranged from like 150 to like what 250 players on average. Normally, yes. This one was a little bit smaller. There was only about 100 people there. Okay, it's, but it's still you made it to top eight out of 100 people. Yeah, still very that's still very impressive. Yeah, absolutely. Austin, what's your favorite color in Magic, and what makes it your favorite color? Uh, generally, well, I can kind of tell that my favorite colors are blue and green. Mm -hmm. um, the way I know this is I have a lot of unstable lands <laughs> that I like to use for all of my decks. And when I go and look at my unstable lands, I can see normally that I either don't have any or very low on the colors of blue and green. Mm -hmm. um, I have tons of white and black ones. I still have over 20 of each of those. <laughs> but <laughs> blue, I'm normally like, oh, I gotta steal this from a different deck. Yeah. Or <laughs> Something like that. I, I generally am running low on those colors. So because you're always using them. I'm always using yeah. them to make Makes sense. Decks. Makes sense. Yeah, of course. Uh, but blue, I like. I like to draw cards. I like yeah. value. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes you you're like, well, I could win the game right now, or I could, you know, draw a bunch of cards. And sometimes you just want to draw a lot of cards. Yeah, draw cards. That's totally fair. Good. Definitely so, been there. This is kind of like leading off to like that question: is what's your favorite color in Magic? Why do you gravitate or? Why do you gravitate towards that color, which you said was blue and green? So, what is your favorite card? Is it going to be in those colors? So, as far as my favorite magic card of all time, it's it's kind of hard to say. There's a lot of cards uh, currently in standard. It's probably Risen Reef. Mm. Reef is very powerful. Risen Reef is a blue green card. In fact. It is. It is a blue is. green card, <laughs> and it does provide a lot of value. It does. Um, just being able to play elementals, get free cards, is uh, very, very fun. Um, overall, all time, I'm not really sure. I mean, there's, I have favorite cards for different decks. I don't know if I have a favorite card of all time. Um, just kind of hard to say. Yeah, it is very hard. Magic has a lot of diverse formats. One of my favorite mechanics is the flickering mechanic, though. Yeah. Just because I like to reuse. Uh, end of the battlefield effect. So, in Commander, I've made multiple decks that are uh, focused on just flickering my creatures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, using using those type of effects of is always uh, something that I enjoy. Repeated effects are always to keep repeating. Yes, yeah, I'm a fan of I'm a fan of uh, end of the battlefield effects and being able to reuse those is a huge, huge deal. Mm -hmm. So, I totally agree with you on that. Okay, real serious, personal, deep question here. Waffles or pancakes? So, my question is, why is uh, why is it limited to waffles or pancakes? Well, what would you like to include on? Generally, that? there's a third option, right? Like oh. when we think about waffles and pancakes, although not quite the same thing. Generally, we have French toast. And is a third well, option, right? yes. That's true. Yeah, what, absolutely. But we all know that people that like French toast over those two are insane. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, so I think no matter what I choose here, we can all agree that the people that choose French toast are insane. I just wrong. Yes. Okay. Um, I like both. Generally, if I'm out to a restaurant and I'm ordering one, I'm going to order pancakes. Mm, okay. The main reason for that is you go to a restaurant, you order waffle, you get a waffle. You get one waffle. You, get, you order pancakes, same price, you get three of them. Ah, so you're going more for like the quality or uh, the quantity over the quality. Right, it's made from the same thing. They use the yeah. same batter for both. It's yeah. just one's thrown into a into a waffle maker, the other one's thrown on the griddle, and they they cook up three of them. Okay, right. so I, I, I kind like, of understand. Let's that. be honest, waffles, pancakes, they taste the same. The, at the end of the day, yes. And you cover them both in syrup and butter, and you call it good. Maybe but some fruit. The <laughs> best thing to put on either of them is peanut butter. Mm. I, will, I will say that. Okay, peanut butter is I'm a big fan good. of it peanut is. butter on my pancakes and waffles. That is so am I. Okay, so I have one uh, final question for you. So okay. if you could go back at any point in Magic history, in like since you started playing Magic, what is the one thing you would do differently that you would change up, I should say? 
one thing that I would do differently. And since you started playing Magic, which you said it was in cons? Yeah, I would I would probably tell myself to just uh, early on better uh, be a better judge of cards in the beginning. Try to figure out, I, I don't know, I uh, might have sold some fetches for cheap mm -hmm. back when I started. Uh, you know, didn't really realize they were good. Thinking, why would I want to pay a life? You know, when you're a new Magic player, right, right. I was starting out in cons. Well, you had two lands in cons. You had your gain lands, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, they they produce uh, two colors. Yeah. They come in tapped, and you gain a life when they enter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you also have fetch lands, which they don't come in tapped, but you have to pay a life to get one color because. You know, at that time you're not really thinking of dual lands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you don't think that you can fetch two colors with a fetch land. Right? Yeah. And I you just think of it as like, wait, why wouldn't I play Evolving Wilds over this? At least I don't lose a life. Yeah, uh, right. So you would go back and just tell yourself? Just try to tell myself to be better early on. I mean, I guess I learned. Yeah. Well, I learned how to be a better player over time, but it'd be nice if I uh, didn't make some of the financial choices with cards uh, yeah. <laughs> that I did when I didn't know how to play as well. Mm -hmm. okay, that's make like, some questionable trades. Uh, I definitely mm -hmm. feel that yeah. one. <laughs> I, I definitely feel that one. I think every player starts out by doing that. You know, you right. have your questionable yes. trades that you make. Your, if you don't make mistakes, you can't really learn. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. makes sense. Absolutely. Okay, well, Austin, we thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. We'll see you next time. So, after all of those wonderful guests, I realized we didn't introduce ourselves. No, they know our names and that that's it. And you know where to find us on Twitter. So, Arvin. Yes. Why don't we just back and forth all of these questions yeah, again? Of so I'm gonna start with you. Yeah. When did you start playing Magic the Gathering? So I started playing Magic, I wanna say right around Theros, right around that time. Like what Theros was ending, Cons was like coming in. Okay, so maybe like Born of the Gods Journey in the yeah, next yeah, time. Yeah, right around that time. Theros is like the first thing that comes to mind. It's like when Devotion was big. My friends were like talking about it. I kept watching and I kept like picking up a little key things. Mm -hmm. It was like one of those things where I was interested in because it reminded me of chess, which I'm a big fan of chess. And there you like, go. Oh, it's a strategy game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So then Thinking they, ahead of your opponent, that sort of thing. Yeah, and my first game was actually with a bunch of like origin cards. Like that's when I first came. I started playing like super casually, but when I went to like my local game shop, I was like with the origins. I played it with this mono red stuff. It was so bad. I had like Titan Strength, or I believe was what it was. Yeah, that's a good Monastery card. Monastery Swift Spear. I just attacked and I did not win a single game. <laughs> well, I mean, that'll happen. I, I did not. That's funny. It's funny that you started on mono red, because Arvin, how do you feel oh, about the color I'm red? Oh, not a fan of red. There I, it is. I'm a blue mage. I, I like say no a lot. We're going to come back to that one later. Oh, yeah, we will. So, now, for you, when did you actually start? So, I started around the same time. I might have started a little earlier. Mm -hmm. My first game of Magic, I distinctly remember, I was in college at the time, and one of my best friends at college invited me to come hang out with him and some people on his dorm floor, and they were playing some game called Magic. So I show up, and I they're in the middle of a game. I did not know at the time it was a standard game between Mono Blue Devotion from Theros and Mono Black Devotion. So a Mono Blue Devotion deck with Master of Waves, make a bunch of little elementals equal to your devotion to blue, and a Mono Black deck with Grey Merchant of Asphodel, oh, and Thought Seeds. Oh, so after watching about half a game, they invited me to sit down and they handed me the mono blue deck. I'm like, but I don't know how to play this game. Yeah, I played it out, I actually was a turn away from winning is what they told me later. Really? With, I, I had gotten Master of Waves out and made probably six or seven elementals. Really? I had built up to it. And then I died to a Gary, the second Gary, yeah. game, which, Black. Great Merchant of Asphodel is a it's good a magic card. card. It's card. You know, it still sees play. Each opponent loses life equal to your devotion to black, and you gain the life equal to the life lost this way. Mm -hmm. I hear that'll kill some people. It, so I've been told. I'm not an expert in the process. I think you've killed me a couple I times. Still play, I still play Gary and Commander all the time. It's a good card. It's oh, a good yeah. card. You, you just play it if you're playing oh, in of black. Of uh, Arvin, yeah. what's your favorite format in Magic, and what makes it your favorite format? So. Originally, I kind of started in Standard, but I quickly transitioned into Legacy. Mm. Standard at the time was powerful, but I enjoy saying 
No. So cards oh, do like, you? Yeah, I, no way. It's almost like I like blue or something. But it, it, cards like Force of Will, um, the Counter Spell, and like Dazed, all those like very very old powerful cards were legal in this format. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of my friends like really enjoyed Legacy, so I started playing Legacy. Um, my first deck was actually Miracles. Man, Miracles was a deck. I won almost none of the games that my in the very beginning, and oh, I, I just love the deck. Eventually, yeah, yeah. I love right, for playing. viewers who aren't familiar with the format of Legacy, can you explain how Miracles? Oh, works? of course. So Miracles as a mechanic is if you've drawn it, usually it has a very large casting cost, but if you draw it for the very first card of your turn, you can cast it for its miracle cost, which is usually very cheap. Like a card like Terminus is a six mana spell that says put all creatures on the bottom of all their opponent's library. But if it's the first card you've drawn each turn, you only cast it for one white. So it becomes a one mana board white, which is very powerful. It's also exceptionally powerful if you can draw cards at instant speed, which Legacy is famous for having a, a certain one mana cantrip. Right. I think it's called Brainstorm. I, I think you're right. And like something with like fetching those cards you don't want. It, it's really weird. Fetch lands do make you shuffle your library. Brainstorm is a single blue instant. You draw three cards. You put two cards from your hand back on top of your library. What you do is you draw three cards. You try to have a miracle on top and you miracle. cast the miracle. Then you put two cards back on top that you don't really need right now. You play a fetch land and you shuffle your library by searching for a land. It's a very, very powerful format. So how the deck miracles worked is they had Sensei's Divining Top, which is a one mana artifact. If you pay one, you can look at the top three cards of your library and rearrange them in any order you want. And its second ability is tap it, draw a card, put the top on top of your library. Ah, top on top. Top on top. So that's when you could abuse the miracle mechanic where you can switch the cards mm -hmm. around. And there was a card called Counterbalance. Counterbalance is oh, one of the stupidest cards ever printed, in my opinion. But it's like, a double blue enchantment that says whenever an opponent casts a spell, you may, re you may look at the top card of your library and then you can reveal it. If it has the same converted mana cost as the spell they cast, counter that spell. So the deck just... Counter, you just said no the entire time. Do you get to rearrange the top of your library to counter everything your opponents do, and cast a bunch of miracles off the top on your turn. Which was very, very dumb. So that was like my favorite deck in that format. Yep. Now, that's just like me, that's where I started. I know not everyone has like the, like the financial stability to like actually afford Legacy. I was fortunate enough to have, a, to have a, that my youth minister just let me use some of his cards. Mm -hmm. But now, bouncing it off to you, what is your favorite format? What deck do you like to play? As much as I really do love a number of formats, including standard, maybe not standard at the moment, but yeah. standard in the past, <laughs> modern, uh, I have played Canadian Highlander before, and I really enjoyed that, but I'm a Commander player at heart, oh. and it doesn't get much better than that. I love the fact that Commander allows you to do anything. Yeah, it's, it allows you to do anything. You have access to some cards that you can't even have oh, in no. Legacy. Which are tough. And you all, it's a singleton format which adds a new aspect of challenge in that you don't have four of everything, you just have one. It's like a, a per, everything is restricted. And it adds a layer of creativity because all commander decks are unique to their pilot and their creator and you get to invest a little bit of yourself into the decks you make. Oh yeah, and like with Commander, like like you said, it's a singleton, you can have a hundred cards, you have your general. So Commander is like one of those formats where it can either be super casual or I'm going to kill you on turn two and you can't stop me. Absolutely. It's, it's insane, it's insane. It's absolutely true. So with Commander, what, is he, what do you usually gravitate towards? I feel like I know uh, the answer to this. I have several Commander decks, but there's always a favorite at the yeah. top of the list and it's one I'm working on foiling out right now. And that is, I know a bunch of you are going to hate me for this, but I, hate you for this. <laughs> I was on this bandwagon before it was a bandwagon. I was on this bandwagon the moment the card was spoiled, mm. attracts a Praetor's voice. I'm playing oh. Super Friends in four colors. Mm. And that deck at our shop <laughs> is well, very well known, not just for the deck, for also the, the pilot. Yeah. But um, do you want to explain how the deck works? So Super Friends is the nickname for the Planeswalkers archetype. So my version, I think, has 24, 25-ish Planeswalkers. The idea is that because Atraxa, who is a white, a blue, a black, and a green, for a 4-4 with Flying, Vigilance, Lifelink, and Death Touch, and at the beginning of your end step, Proliferate, has four keywords. Five four. if you count proliferate, yeah. yeah. It's four, four evergreen. It's why. It's absolutely insane. 
So proliferate lets you put counters on permanents and players, permanents and players that have counters already on them. And that includes planeswalkers. So the idea is that I'm going to play out planeswalkers like you would in modern or standard or wherever. Any other format. The difference is that they're going to get an extra loyalty counter at my end step, which is which helps them to get ahead of so it usually it tends to reduce the time it takes to get to their last ability by a turn or two. Which is and that's powerful. huge. What you want to be doing with this deck is you want to be casting a card called Doubling Season, yeah. which is an old school enchantment, four and a green. You, whenever any number of counters would be placed on a permanent you control, put twice as many on them instead. And if you would create any number of tokens, create double that many instead. Doubling Season is from a time before Planeswalkers existed, so as a result, yeah. the way that the, the Planeswalkers interact with Doubling Season is they will come in with twice as many loyalty counters, and for a lot of Planeswalkers, that means they get to use their last ability right away. A lot of really stupid things you can do with that deck, and I really enjoy playing with Planeswalkers. It's my favorite card type in Magic, so... It's, there you are. It's also like one of the most powerful things you can do with magic. It's very hard to interact with. So like in that deck, you also just like play a bunch of like destroyed creature effects. Wrath of God, Damnation, Day of, uh, I don't have Day of Judgment specifically, mm -hmm. but uh, like, a lot of cards. Deluge. Yeah, Toxic Deluge. A lot of board wipes, a lot of spot removal that interacts with any type of permanent things like Anguish on Making. Mm -hmm. What's the one? Utter End. Utter End. Vindicate. Vindicate is one. Maelstrom Pulse. Maelstrom Pulse. At Assassin's Trophy. Stuff that is just targeted removal. Yep. Just sweep the board. And you have Planeswalker. That, that, that's no You can spirit. build it in a lot of different ways, but it, yep. it's very powerful. And if you let it get going, it will yep. It will stop you from playing Magic the Gathering. It's kind of like how Slivers were, but that's a whole other conversation. For yeah, a we'll have that conversation someday. Oh, yeah. Arvin, what's your favorite color in Magic? We've been over this, but oh, I yeah. need to explain why why is it blue? Okay, so blue because I don't know if you if you look back at Magic, I believe uh, it was Ian who mentioned this earlier. It's the power nine is all colorless artifacts and blue cards for a very good reason. Blue is the most the, the older you get in Magic, blue is one of the most powerful well, colors in general. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because you can do like cards like you can do stuff like draw cards, counter spells. Blue is very powerful. It's it, it's one of those colors that if you put it in, it goes with any other color. Yeah. You put it in white, you you get a very very powerful control deck. Mm -hmm. And also the blue creatures usually are not very very they're decently sized. It's just their ability tends to force the game heavily in your favor. It's it's mm -hmm. just. Oh, There's a lot of blue creatures with flash, so you yeah. can surprise people. There's a lot of blue creatures with flying. Mm. You can kind of go over top of faces. people. There's quite a few yeah, faces. yeah. But anyways, what about you? I feel like I know the answer to this. What is your? I think you might be color? surprised. My favorite color, my favorite single color in Magic: The Gathering is black. Really? Okay. Yeah. I was thinking it was going to be blue because blue is definitely one of my. Blue is my second favorite. It's, okay, it's okay. not close. So then why black? Black is very good at doing almost everything that the other colors can do. You just have to pay an additional price. Black is very good at destroying creatures, which I love doing. Yeah. Black is very good at taking cards out of your opponent's hands, which I love doing. Black yeah. is very good at bringing things back from the graveyard, which I love doing. The graveyard is just a second the hand. Graveyard. It really is. If you play older Magic, the Think of your graveyard as the second hand. You said it correctly. It really yeah. is. Black is the color of everything is a resource if you know how to use it mm -hmm. and if you know how to conserve it properly. My life total is a resource. Black will happily pay like... Oh, we course. talked about Toxic Deluge. Yeah. Two in a black sorcery, pay X life and an additional yeah. cost. Each creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn. I will happily use my life total mm -hmm. to make all your creatures die. So, like, uh, I believe it was also, again, Ian who uh, brought up a card which is very, very powerful in right now. It's uh, Surgical Extraction. Paying life instead of mana is very powerful in any mm -hmm. format. So, paying two life to remove a key piece of your opponent's deck is extremely powerful. For so those of you who don't know, uh, Surgical Extraction is uh, one uh, Phyrexian mana black, which means you've got to pay a single black or two life, instant. Uh, exile target card in, in, a, in a graveyard, so it can be your own, and all other copies in that player's deck. I believe it says other than a basic land. Yes, it, can, it cannot be a basic land. Yeah. Black does not care about paying a life, no. they will pay as much life no. as possible. to. Two life for that effect is extremely strong, especially at instant speed. Yeah, it's... <laughs> uh, the other thing I like with black is that 
you you get to mimic certain things that other colors are better at. So black actually has very good mana ramp. You get things like cabal coffers and you get uh, a lot of you yeah. get think Liliana of the Dark Realms lets you tutor up swamps and with like cabal coffers sort of you have the combo with Urborg where yep. you make a lot of mana. Yep. Black is actually pretty good at mana ramp. The oldest rituals are not red. They no, are black, they are black, dark ritual, cabal ritual. They're all black. There are some old school creatures that sacrifice or tap to add black mana to your mana pool. Also, the most powerful tutors are black. I was coming around to that. One of my favorite cards in Magic is Demonic Tutor, which yep. is one in a black. Search your library for a card, put it in your hand, shuffle your library. For two mana. For two mana. powerful in formats where you only have one of everything. Demonic yep. Tutor says, no, I have two. Yeah. Vampiric Tutor says, I have three. Oh, Vampiric Tutor is so powerful. And of course, you can get to like older and get to like Imperial Seal and all of the other. Yep. Like, There's... Yeah. There's, Black just offers so much versatility and so much ability to answer nearly any situation. The only thing it really fails in is artifacts and enchantments. Yeah. And other than that, Black has gotten a lot of spells lately that exile creatures, mm -hmm. exile planeswalkers. Which is very powerful. Black is the interaction with planeswalkers, and so I love having that in so many of my decks. There's a lot of Black decks that I have. Oh, yeah. For I'm course. a big, big fan. That's my favorite color. Arvin. <laughs> Since we're on favorites, what is your favorite card in the game, Magic the Gathering? Oh, okay, so this one is really, really difficult. I don't have a favorite card, right. but since I touched up on, like, Miracles, I'm a big fan of the card Counterbalance. Uh, Counterbalance is... Is one of my least favorite cards in Magic, yeah. but go on. So, I, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Go so on. Counterbalance uh, is one of those cards... I like saying no. Anytime my opponent's like... so. Actually, I'm gonna like rephrase that a little. Okay. Bit. It's between counterbalance and a little card called stasis. Ooh, <laughs> stasis is. A, you want to talk like, about two po powerful two mana enchantments that really just don't belong in magic? No, no, they don't. So, really said what counterbalance does. Yeah. Stasis is a like you said two mana enchantment, one blue, one of any color, and it, it the card says all players skip their own tap step at the beginning of your upkeep. Pay one blue or bury it. Bury it is just an old uh, term for put it in your graveyard or sacrifice it. So there's a lot of dumb combos where you get to untap stuff and your opponent does Basically your opponents don't have fun. You get to say no all the time. And you yeah. win with like a very large creature. Yeah, exactly. And it does it. It makes for very interesting games where you, you become, if you're like in Commander, you become Arch Enemy, for example. Mm -hmm. Most Commander games you should play in the pod of four. So, there's a number of cards in Magic that talk about untapping things during your opponent's untap step. Yeah. Did you know that those cards don't work if your opponent also skips their untap step? Yep. Yeah. So, if your opponent can't ever untap, they can't ever hurt you, they can't ever play cards, and then of course you combine it with a bunch of other cards, which makes the game not fun. Yeah. But, again, that's more of like, blue player, I'm gonna lock you down, you don't do anything. I mean, my favorite card in Magic is also blue, so I'm not yeah, that Yeah, you can't really, like, speak I, don't, I wouldn't call it that oppressive, but... Ah, stasis is not that oppressive, it's, it's powerful. Sure. <laughs> but, like, bouncing off DJC, what is your favorite card in Magic? Well, it's funny, because we brought it up earlier by accident when I was talking about Super Friends. My favorite card uh, in Magic is Tamiyo Field Researcher. Yup, that card is... Tamiyo Field helpful. Researcher. Uh, Tamiyo Field Researcher also comes from my favorite Magic set, which is Eldritch Moon. Oh, I want to go back. Tamiyo, it was a good time in Magic. Tamiyo Field Researcher is one, a white, a blue, and a green for a four loyalty planeswalker, Tamiyo. Mm. She comes in and has three abilities. The plus one is choose up to two target creatures until your next turn, whenever either of those creatures deals combat damage any combat damage, you draw a card. So, if you pick two creatures with Vigilance, and you attack with them, two creatures you control with Vigilance, and you attack with them, and they get blocked, or they don't, you get to draw two cards. Already, she said draw two cards. And whenever your opponents attack, and you block with them, it's still combat You draw damage. more cards. More cards. You could draw up to four cards. So you could draw, in Commander, you could draw somewhere like you eight could, cards you could if you blocked lots. everybody with them. It's, like it's really, really dumb. Blue likes to draw cards. It's, it's it's a little it's a weird concept. That would never happen. No, of course not. That would never happen. The minus two is t uh, tap up to two target non-land permanents. Those permanents do not untap during their controller's next untap step. 
So the original Tamiyo had a plus one of tap target permanent. It doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. This one taps two things, but they have to be non-lands. Yeah. That ability is extremely good at protecting Tamiyo because if you're in a 1v1 and you play Tamiyo on four and your opponent has two creatures, you're like, all right, they, they sideways. Better have something with and haste. Yeah, if you don't have something with haste, your opponent kind of gets to sit there and go, I guess Tamiyo's still alive. You can go ahead. I'll, I'll play some stuff, but yeah. you can go ahead. You're like, okay. Now I'm going to untap, I'm going to play some creatures out with the man I have, and I'm also going to plus on those creatures to draw some cards when they die blocking for Tamiyo. So tell us about your uh, favorite ability on Tamiyo, JC. This is, minus uh, 7, the ultimate yeah. ability. The minus 7 on Tamiyo says, draw 3 cards, also called Ancestral Recall. Yeah. Then you get an emblem with, you may cast non-land cards from your hand without paying their mana cost. You get Omniscience. Omniscience is a 7 and triple blue enchantment that yeah. does the same thing, but it's a 10 mana enchantment. This is just minus 7 on a Planeswalker. And as we discussed earlier, if you have doubling season in play and you play Tamiyo, or if you have Tamiyo in play and you proliferate her a bunch or play a deep glow skate to double the counters on her, she goes to eight, and, and if you minus, not only get, do you get to draw three cards and hop omniscience for the rest of the game, she's still alive. Yup. So, those of you who don't know, um, Planeswalker emblems, you cannot interact with them. Nope. There is one way that is allowed in Magic, which is Card Liberated's Ultimate, which is a minus 14, is yeah. where you restart the game. That is the only way you can interact with them. You can also uh, counter the activated ability yes, with certain yes. cards, but you have to have the card in that moment and be ready for it because there's you can't interact with many other Once ways. the emblem exists, the only way to stop it is to reset the game or kill the player. That's literally the only way. So once you have an omniscience no one can interact with, it becomes quite good. Casting being able to do that ability and then cast Wrath of God for free and have yeah. three counter spells in your hand is the it's scariest powerful. thing ever. Because your opponents just go, well I'm gonna pay nine mana for something stupid and you go, I'm gonna yeah, pay zero and say no you can't. Yeah. It's, it's not an okay ability. This it's is where we want to be in Magic the Gathering, boys and girls. Yeah. Time for some extra personal questions. Ooh, okay, I like this, I like this. Okay, Arvin. Mm. Why do you enjoy the archetype of stacks? So I like this archetype because it brings up this weird game, no matter what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It brings up to the point where you're also heavily taxed by this, but your deck is built in a way where it's constructed to give you the most benefit. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I mentioned earlier, like you can have Winter Orb, mm -hmm. and you can have a car, uh, card like Frozen Ether, mm -hmm. where even if they have lands that come into play untapped, Frozen Ether will make them come into play tapped, and if they have creatures with Vigilance, they will still come into play tapped, yep. so it will not matter. Yep. And it makes this weird game where they have to kind of try to get around this weird predicament. Most stacks decks are usually in blue. There's, of course, multiple other things. Yep. Blue is the most prevalent color because you can counter their spells if they try to get out of it. Yep. And you just lock them out of the game. You mm -hmm. just don't let them play anything. It's, it's the idea of, this is bad for me, but it's worse for you. Yes. Every time it's worse it's for you. It's always worse for you. It's, there's a stacks player, you stop the stacks player at all costs, even if you're going to like be in a very bad position because you're going to be in a worse position if that person goes off. Mm -hmm. It's not a very, very fun thing to do. So you would say your enjoyment comes from the fact that I can stop my opponents from playing and I can continue to play yes. and win sort of through an attrition style. Yes. And like eventually we can, I can interact with like my own stuff where if I need to like destroy it or I can, I have that ability because I can stop other people from mm -hmm. destroying it. You can remove the things that are hurting you, but you can cause them to continue to hurt other right. players. It's, it's a very, very interesting gameplay. It's definitely a real archetype and something you need to keep an eye out for. Oh yeah. So, oh, we're getting a little bit of a personal question here. So, I know you have, uh, like, like you said, you like the track, so it's kind of like your pet deck, you have mm -hmm. it all foiled out. So, in the future, do you, do you see anything you're going to like foil out? You enjoy like the high-end parts of Magic. Do you see any other deck like replacing Atraxa that it's going to get that treatment? Or is there anything... Like, is there anything that's going to take its place? Because I know Atraxa is kind You're of like, asking me if I'm going to replace Atraxa. Basically my baby. Yeah, like, pretty much. Like, or is there oh, something that's going to... make me think about that? <laughs> I, so I'm one of those people that tries not to believe that thing, anything is truly impossible. Yeah. There is absolutely a possibility that someday they could invent a magic card or, or an archetype or maybe a commander for super friends that I would love more than Atraxa. I'm not betting on it. 
It's well, not, it but however, it's not, well, if, if it does happen, I'm certainly willing to focus my efforts on that. Also, I'm not, will, I'm not willing to say that I will never put that kind of treatment into another deck, but it would, it would be a while, and I would have to be convinced that I'm going to play that deck for a very long time. I know I will play a track yes. cell until that deck is unplayable or something. It's something I really want to play in the deck gets banned and I just get sick of it. But I don't see that happening anytime soon. And so I don't feel that there's going to be any sort of... There, there's not going to be a deck yeah, or, or, or any cards that outside of that deck that I really feel... Obviously, new cards will be printed yeah, in the Magic that will replace certain cards in that deck. Of course. And those I will try to give the proper treatment for a track sub, but I don't, you don't see anything. Else. I don't I don't have a prediction. I I would bet money against me mm -hmm. giving anything the the kind of special care and the kind of like the, the attention and the love that I have for so that attracts of that. How long did it take you uh, I know you're not completely finished with it just yet, but how yeah. long did it take you for you to get to the point where you are with the tracks. I'm mean, actually like, even trying to think of when I started foiling the deck. I want to say it was maybe a year and a half or two years ago that I really started getting into that. A couple of the cards that I got for it were coincidentally foil. Okay, I mean like... Atraxa so is an example, like yeah. that card is only printed in foil. There's like some cards that you, I know, cannot get in foil. So yeah, there's alter. there's three cards that came out of commander sets, so I would, mm -hmm. I'm would i I'm looking to find a way to get alternate yeah. arts of those or just you know, foil, custom right. foils of those, but those are um, a little bit more difficult to find. So yeah, find exactly. That makes and it. it's just me putting the time into it and stuff like that. And right. It's I also not cheap. Other things. No. It is definitely not cheap. Don't no, foil something. something the, the good news is a lot of those I've been able to trade stuff for, yeah. use trade credit for. Uh, so that's definitely helped. But oh, of course. Uh, I would say, so it's probably been about a year and a half since I started. I, I would say it's been about a year since I started focusing on foiling it. Mm -hmm. But I would, I would say it's been about a year and a half or two years since I started intentionally getting Don't certain, foil. like when I would get cards for it, I would intentionally get the foil version instead. But it was probably about a year ago that I started saying, okay, I'm going to look for the foil versions of cards that are already in the deck that aren't foil. Okay, because like I know like you started out and like you kind of got to it, but then eventually you kind of like I'm gonna keep going, I'm gonna mm -hmm. keep going, and eventually when War of the Spark came out, you got a bunch of new planes, well, oh, yeah. which we got a bunch of things. Some so big help. Dominaria was big too. Dominaria, so we got some oh, very good spells from there. So glad we returned to it. <laughs> so glad, but I'm glad we went back. It's a topic for something else. I think yeah. we're all out of time for yep. the time being. So we're going to transition to our ending segment, which we call news or brews. Today we're going to be on news, and we're going to talk about the SCG Open in Dallas Fort Worth. So we're reviewing. SCG Open, mm -hmm. Star City Games Open, Dallas Fort Worth, and this is the first Star City Games modern event post banning of Hogak, Arisen Necropolis, and yeah. Faithless Looting, and with the unbanning of Stoneforge Mystic. Which I kind of uh, we were like we were talking about it before the mm -hmm. whole thing, and I'm actually happy with Stoneforge Mystic being a modern. Like, I, really I agree. I, this is a card I think they should have unbanned a while ago. I think it's a card that will allow for some interesting builds in modern, mm -hmm. but not necessarily... It's a card that's never been in modern because it was banned yeah. before modern started because of its the, usefulness in a certain standard deck called Cawblade. Yeah, which is a if you don't know what it topic. is, you don't need to. It's, it's, it, it broke magic. Yeah, exactly. That's all we uh, need to talk about. I, it's, at this point, it's kind of been laughable that it was on the ban list still, yeah. and now that it's off, I think it's, it's... It's a good thing. It's going to be interesting to see what people do with it. I don't think it's going to be the most powerful thing in modern, No. but I think it's going to have a place. Oh, 100%. So, like... Off of that, um, we're kind of gonna like just go over like the top eight. We're not. We can look through the top sixteen, but it's not really like anything noteworthy. It's just there's a couple of interesting decks. Yeah. Like, so the winner mm, of this top eight is four color Wurza, as it's called. It's Wurza. it's Urza High Lord Artificer from Modern Horizons, mm -hmm. and you use War of Invention to tutor the Thopter Sword combo. combo. Uh, Thopter Foundry is. A Orzov hybrid mm -hmm. and a blue for a an artifact. You can pay one and sacrifice a non-token artifact to make a one. you make a one-one flying Thopter and you gain one life. A blue Thopter. It is blue, so which is relevant. And yeah, I think 
that was one of the only times that Lilithopters yeah. were blue. Maybe there was. A There's a couple other cards, cards, but it's, it's not. It's, common. Great, it's not. Oh, well, it's really not. And the so, the card you combine it with is Sword of the Meat, which is a two mana artifact, and the equip it's an equipment, but the equip cost is irrelevant. Gives the equipped creature plus one plus two, but whenever a one one creature enters the battlefield, you may return Sword of the Meat from your graveyard to the battlefield to equip to that creature. So what you do is, for any amount of mana that you have, you can pay one to sacrifice the sword to make a Thopter, which then triggers the sword and brings it back attached to that Thopter. Now, With yeah. Urza, you can tap your artifacts for blue. And you go infinite. And you make infinite Thopters, gain infinite life, have right. infinite blue mana. You're, you, there's, you could have like different win conditions at that point, mm -hmm. but usually infinite damage and infinite life means good game. Exactly. So that was the winning deck. Uh, what else is noteworthy about this top so, eight? The top eight is kind of weird. Like whenever there's a banning or unbanning in modern, some decks like pop out. Like Affinity, I've not seen in a very long time. Yeah, even hardened scales is kind yeah, of a it's rarity just nowadays. Gone. But it is strange to see three burn decks at the top eight, which is like. I kind of get the feeling that it has to do with burn having an okay chance mm -hmm. against Urza because if Urza doesn't pop off on like the within like turn three turn four turn five right. burn is just gonna say okay you're dead I'm before you can come off yeah and like there was of course a death shadow deck with kind of like the same thing a classic death shadow, Rixus, death shadow. Yep. uh there's a titan shift deck and uh there's, there's a mono green tron with uh karn i believe the whole michael sith lock which yep. is pretty karn good. the great creator so the more recent versions of mono green tron have been using for karn the great creator to mm -hmm. look for certain artifacts in your sideboard uh, an artifact outside the game and put it in your hand. You okay. use this to find Microsynth Lattice helps you lock up the game yep. because all permanents are artifacts and Karn says your opponent's artifacts can't have use activated abilities, which includes their lands. Then, but you also time. get some silver bullet cards. You get like yeah, Pithing yeah. Needle, you get Chalice of the Void, you get some Trade Sphere, you get extra of copies of Walking Ballista and Worm right. Coil Engine. You just get a number of answers yeah. for everything it, in your sideboard. It's kind of like what Birthing Pot was at the time. You just exactly. grab stuff. It's a toolbox deck. It's a toolbox deck. Correct. But you also get all the Tron, uh, the fun Tron parts yeah, of get playing Karn Liberated, like Ugin, Ugin, Spirit Dragon, Ulamog, Ulamog, and stuff like that. You still play Worm Coil Engine, the, at least one or two Ballistas in the main. Okay, so JC, this is one of those decks where it's very interesting. You want to talk about what was the other deck that was in the top eight? So the eighth deck listed here is a Rakdos midrange deck, and we saw this and didn't really know what to expect coming into it. So this looks like if you took old school Mardu Pyromancer from before Faithless Looting was banned, you cut the white completely, you cut the, the paths and the... Uh, the lingering souls yeah. that were in the deck, some of the sideboard cards maybe. You cut all of that and you play, so you're playing, you're still them. playing Bedlam Reveler, yeah. you're playing Seasoned Pyromancer, you're not playing Young Pyromancer no, anymore, but there's two copies play. of Hazaret the Fervent in this deck, which I think is awesome. That was actually very interesting. That card, I actually really like that card. Yeah. And the, when it was in standard, it was... Hazaret lets you discard cards. Hazaret can only attack or block if you have one or fewer cards in hand. Mm -hmm. So you can discard extra cards to Hazaret to, to deal two damage to each of your opponents. Which is extremely powerful. It also has the new rare Chandra. Like, she can make two 1-1s one -ones that have haste yeah, for the turn. Can she can put extra loyalty counters on red planeswalkers, which in this deck is only herself. Yep. But oh, There's a sideboard Chandra Torch. Okay, yeah, there I guess you, go. you can get there. So and you like, can start plusing that. And then the minus lets you cast an instant or sorcery with converted mm -hmm. man costs three or less from your graveyard. Which is so, like your which is a lot. I, is. There's fatal push in this deck. Inquisition. There's a thought seize. Thought seize and Inquisition. Colgon's command. Colgon's we talked about earlier about how yeah. that's a good card. You get lightning bolts, and of course you have Lily on the veil. Because if you're playing black and you can play Lily, you usually play Lily. So this is a heavily red deck. Mm. There's there's some black stuff in yeah. there, but it's a heavily red deck. So this deck is playing three copies of Blood Moon in the main, which is. Fair. Like, don't get me wrong. Blood Moon against some decks, like like you said, they're just silver bullets. Like, uh, like one of the big decks that comes to mind is Tron. If Tron can't remove Blood Moon, they will lose very very quickly. Or if they can't get to seven mana, they will lose very very quickly. There's other decks that have a very very greedy mana base that will also just they if they can't be Blood Moon, they'll lose. Blood Moon. He likes Tron. Or like, I'm a Tron player for modern players out there. Sorry to anyone. Not sorry, yeah. but. Uh, I absolutely hate Blood Moon, but I know why it's necessary. And 
this seems like a sweet Blood Moon deck. Mm -hmm. You can you can get some you can get a Lilion out early, or you know use your Fatal Push and your Inquisition, your Thought Seize, maybe a Colagon's Command, and then you can play out your your Blood Moon and, your Blood Moon and just the game. lock out certain decks because they can't tap, tap for anything other than red sometimes. Pretty good. It's good. The sideboard is pretty standard for what you'd expect. Yes. Chandra Torture Defiance and Collective Brutalities, a Kalidus. Kalidus, Traitor of Get yeah. Out, a big fan of that card. Yeah, like, that's, a, that's a nice card against blank. Burn. It's really hard to kill. Uh, another Kolagon's Command, Nile Spellbomb, yep. some Pillage, which destroys lands, Plague so, Engineer for the all small stuff. creature decks, and Surgical Extraction. Like the, the usual sideboard. It's just the main board was a little interesting. This so deck looks awesome. Out. Oh, yeah. Uh, like, I'm kind of digging it. If we can, uh, we might be able to show it on uh, one of our videos. Maybe I hope we try this sometime. Yeah, this is this is a cool deck. I wonder if this one's going to see any like further play now that you know it's made its yeah. debut at this. I don't know. This, this is, I think this is a good direction for Marty Pyramid oh, to go. Like, like it's so. there's no dredge isn't really dead, but it's. No. It's kind of like in the water. We'll, we'll see how it comes up in a couple of weeks. We'll revisit in a few weeks. Yeah. All right, Arvin, do you want to remind people where to find uh, us? So if you want to find us, we're always at Twitter at Vault underscore Mana. And of course, we're, you're seeing us on YouTube, so if you can subscribe, hit that like button, uh, hit the bell, give us a comment, maybe share it with your friends. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. And until next time, this has been the Mana Vault Podcast. The vault is now closed.